Chapter 17 of The Last Galley, Impressions and Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aaron James Walker. The Last Galley, Impressions and Tales, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The Lord of Falconbridge, Part 3 of 3. They were standing under the shadow of the trees, so that he was very visible to them, while they were out of his sight. Tom Spring looked hard at the man, who was still some hundreds of yards away. He was a tall, powerful fellow, clad in a blue coat with gilt buttons, which gleamed in the sun. He had white corded breeches and riding boots. He walked with a vigorous step, and with every few strides he struck his leg with a dog whip which hung from his wrist. There was a great suggestion of purpose and of energy in the man's appearance and bearing. "'Why, he's a gentleman,' said Spring. "'Look here, ma'am. This is all a bit out of my line. I have nothing against the man, and he can mean me no harm. What am I to do with him? Fight him! Smash him! That is what you are here for! Tom Spring turned on his heel with disgust. I am here to fight, ma'am, but not to smash a man who has no thought of fighting. It's off. You don't like the look of him, hissed the woman. You have met your master. That is as may be. It is no job for me. The woman's face was white with vexation and anger. You fool, she cried. Is all to go wrong at the last minute? There are fifty pounds. Here, they are in this paper. Would you refuse them? It's a cowardly business. I won't do it. Cowardly? You are giving the man two stone, and he can beat any amateur in England. The young pugilist felt relieved. After all, if he could fairly earn that fifty pounds, a good deal depended upon his winning it. If he could only be sure that this was a worthy and willing antagonist, how do you know he is so good? he asked. I ought to know. I am his wife. As she spoke, she turned and was gone like a flash among the bushes. The man was quite close now, and Tom Spring's scruples weakened as he looked at him. He was a powerful, broad-chested fellow, about thirty, with a heavy, brutal face, great thatched eyebrows, and a hard-set mouth. He could not be less than fifteen stone in weight, and he carried himself like a trained athlete. As he swung along, he suddenly caught a glimpse of Spring among the trees, and he at once quickened his pace and sprang over the stile which separated them. Aloha, said he, halting a few yards from him and staring him up and down. Who the devil are you? And where the devil did you come from? And what the devil are you doing on my property? His manner was even more offensive than his words. It brought a flush of anger to Spring's cheeks. See here, mister, said he. Silver words is cheap. You're no call to speak to me like that. You infernal rascal, cried the other. I'll show you the way out of that plantation with the toe of my boot. Do you dare to stand there on my land and talk back at me? He advanced with a menacing face and his dog whip half raised. Well, are you going? He cried as he swung it into the air. Tom Spring jumped back to avoid the threatened blow. Go slow, mister, said he. It's only fair that you should know where you are. I'm Spring, the prize fighter. Maybe you have heard my name? I thought you were a rascal of that breed, said the man. I've had the handling of one or two of you gentry before, and I've never found one that could stand up to me for five minutes. Maybe you would like to try? If you hit me with that dog whip, mister. There, then, he gave the young man a vicious cut across the shoulder. Will that help you to fight? I came here to fight said Tom Spring, licking his dry lips. You can drop that whip, mister, for I will fight. I'm a trained man and ready, but you would have it. Don't blame me. The man was stripping the blue coat from his broad shoulders. There was a sprigged satin vest beneath it, and they were hung together on an alder branch. Trained, are you? he muttered. By the Lord, I'll train you before I am through. Any fears that Tom Spring may have had, lest he should be taking some unfair advantage, were set at rest by the man's assured manner and by the splendid physique, which became more apparent as he discarded a black satin tie, with a great ruby glowing in its center, and threw aside the white collar which cramped his thick muscular neck. He then, very deliberately, undid a pair of gold sleeve links, and, rolling up his shirt sleeves, disclosed two hairy and muscular arms, which would have served as a model for a sculptor. "'Come nearer the style,' said he when he had finished. "'There is more room.' The prize-fighter had kept pace with the preparations of his formidable antagonist. His own hat, coat, and vest hung suspended upon a bush. 
He advanced now into the open space which the other had indicated. Ruffianing or fighting? asked the amateur coolly. Fighting. Very good, said the other. Put up your hands, Spring. Try it out. They were standing facing one another in a grassy ring intersected by the path at the outlet of the wood. The insolent and overbearing look had passed away from the amateur's face, but a grim half-smile was on his lips and his eyes shone fiercely from under his tufted brows. From the way in which he stood it was very clear that he was a past master at the game. Tom Spring, as he paced lightly to right and left, looking for an opening, became suddenly aware that neither with Stringer nor with the redoubtable painter himself had he ever faced a more business-like opponent. The amateur's left was well-formed, his guard low, his body leaning back from the haunches, and his head well out of danger. Spring tried a light lead at the mark, and another at the face, but in an instant his adversary was on to him with a shower of sledgehammer blows, which it took him all his time to avoid. He sprang back, but there was no getting away from that whirlwind of muscle and bone. A heavy blow beat down his guard, a second landed on his shoulder, and over went the prize fighter with the other on the top of him. Both sprang to their feet, glared at each other, and fell into position once more. There could be no doubt that the amateur was not only heavier, but also the harder and stronger man. Twice again he rushed spring down, once by the weight of his blows, and once by closing and hurling him onto his back. Such falls might have shaken the fight out of a less game man, but to Tom Spring they were but instants in his daily trade. Though bruised and winded, he was always up again in an instant. Blood was trickling from his mouth, but his steadfast blue eyes told of the unshaken spirit within. He was accustomed now to his opponent's rushing tactics, and he was ready for them. The fourth round was the same as to attack, but it was very different in defense. Up to now the young man had given way and been fought down. This time he stood his ground. As his opponent rushed in, he met him with a tremendous straight hit from his left hand, delivered with the full force of his body, and doubled in effect by the momentum of the charge. So stunning was the concussion that the pugilist himself recoiled from it across the grassy ring. The amateur staggered back and leaned his shoulder on a tree trunk, his hand up to his face. "'You'd best drop it,' said Spring. "'You'll get pepper if you don't.' The other gave an inarticulate curse and spat out a mouthful of blood. "'Come on,' said he. Even now the pugilist found that he had no light task before him. Warned by his misadventure, the heavier man no longer tried to win the battle at a rush, nor to beat down an accomplished boxer as he would a country hawbuck at a village fair. He fought with his head and his feet as well as with his hands. Spring had to admit in his heart that, trained to the ring, this man must have been a match for the best. His guard was strong, his counter was like lightning. He took punishment like a man of iron, and when he could safely close, he always brought his lighter antagonist to the ground with a shattering fall. But the one stunning blow which he had courted before he was taught respect for his adversary weighed heavily on him all the time. His senses had lost something of their quickness and his blows of their sting. He was fighting, too, against a man who, of all the boxers who have made their names great, was the safest, the coolest, the least likely to give anything away, or lose an advantage gained. Slowly, gradually, round by round, he was worn down by his cool, quick-stepping, sharp-hitting antagonist. At last he stood exhausted, breathing hoarsely, his face what could be seen of it, purple with exertions. He had reached the limit of human endurance. His opponent stood waiting for him, bruised and beaten, but as cool as ready, as dangerous as ever. You'd best drop it, I tell you, said he. You're done. But the other's manhood would not have it so. With a snarl of fury, he cast his science to the winds and rushed madly to slogging with both hands. For a moment, spring was overborne. Then he sidestepped swiftly. There was the crash of his blow, and the amateur tossed up his arms and fell all a sprawl, his great limbs outstretched, his disfigured face to the sky. For a moment, Tom Spring stood looking down at his unconscious opponent. The next, he felt a soft, warm hand upon his bare arm. The woman was at his elbow. Now is your time, she cried, her dark eyes aflame. Go in, smash him. Spring shook her off with a cry of disgust, but she was back in an instant. I'll make it seventy-five pounds. The fight's over, ma'am. I can't touch him. A hundred pounds. A clear hundred. I have it here in my bodice. Would you refuse a hundred? He turned on his heel. She darted past him and tried to kick at the face of the prostrate man. 
Spring dragged her roughly away before she could do him a mischief. Stand clear, he cried, giving her a shake. You should take shame to hit a fallen man. With a groan, the injured man turned on his side. Then he slowly sat up and passed his wet hand over his face. Finally, he staggered to his feet. Well, he said, shrugging his broad shoulders. It was a fair fight. I have no complaint to make. I was Jackson's favorite pupil, but I give you best. Suddenly, his eyes lit upon the furious face of the woman. Hello, Betty, he cried. So I have you to think. I might have guessed it when I had your letter. Yes, my lord, said she with a mock curtsy. You have me to thank. Your little wife managed it all. I lay behind you those bushes, and I saw you beaten like a hound. You haven't had all that I had planned for you, but I think it will be some little time before any woman loves you for the sake of your appearance. Do you remember the words, my lord? Do you remember the words? He stood stunned for a moment. Then he snatched his whip from the ground and looked at her from under his heavy brows. I believe you're the devil, he cried. I wonder what the governess will think, said she. He flared into furious rage and rushed at her with his whip. Tom Spring threw himself before him with his arms out. I won't do it, sir. I can't stand by. The man glared at his wife over the prize fighter's shoulder. So it's for dear George's sake, he said with a bitter laugh. But poor broken-nosed George seems to have gone to the wall. Taken up with a prize fighter, eh? Found a fancy man for yourself. You liar, she gasped. Ha, my lady, that stings your pride, does it? Well... You shall stand together in the dock for trespass and assault. What a picture, great lord, what a picture. You wouldn't, John. Wouldn't I? Bye. You stay there three minutes and see if I wouldn't. He seized his clothes from the bush and staggered off as swiftly as he could across the field, blowing a whistle as he ran. Quick, quick, cried the woman. There's not an instant to lose. Her face was livid and she was shivering and panting with apprehension. He'll raise the country. It would be awful, awful. She ran swiftly down the torturous path, Spring following after her and dressing as he went. In a field to the right, a gamekeeper, his gun in his hand, was hurrying towards the whistling. Two laborers, loading hay, had stopped their work and were looking about them, their pitchforks in their hands. But the path was empty, and the phaeton awaited them, the horse cropping the grass by the lane side, the driver half asleep on his perch. The woman sprang swiftly in and motioned Spring to stand by the wheel. There's your fifty pounds, she said, handing him a paper. You were a fool not to turn it into a hundred when you had the chance. I'm done with you now. But where am I to go? asked the prize fighter, gazing around him at the winding lanes. To the devil, said she. Drive on, Johnson. The phaeton whirled down the road and vanished round a curve. Tom Spring was alone. Everywhere over the countryside he heard shoutings and whistlings. It was clear that so long as she escaped the indignity of sharing his fate, his employer was perfectly indifferent as to whether he got into trouble or not. Tom Spring began to feel indifferent himself. He was weary to death. His head was aching from the blows and falls which he had received, and his feelings were raw from the treatment which he had undergone. He walked slowly some few yards down the lane, but had no idea which way to turn to reach Tunbridge Wells. In the distance he heard the baying of dogs, and he guessed that they were being set upon his track. In that case he could not hope to escape them, and might just as well await them where he was. He picked out a heavy stake from the hedge, and he sat down moodily waiting, in a very dangerous temper, for what might befall him. But it was a friend and not a foe who came first into sight. Round the corner of the lane flew a small dog cart with a fast-trotting chestnut cob between the shafts. In it was seated the rubicund landlord of the Royal Oak, his whip going, his face continually flying round to glance behind him. Jump in, Mr. Spring, jump in, he cried as he reined up. They're all coming, dogs and men, come on. Now, hut up, Ginger. Not another word did he say until two miles of lanes had been left behind them at racing speed, and they were back in safety upon the Brighton Road. Then he let the reins hang loose on the pony's back, and he slapped Tom Spring with his fat hand upon his shoulder. Splendid, he cried his great red face shining with ecstasy. Oh, Lord, but it was beautiful. What? cried Spring. You saw the fight? Every round of it. By George, to think that I should have lived to have had such a fight all to myself. Oh, but it was grand, he cried in a frenzy of delight. 
to see his lordship go down like a pith ox and her ladyship clapping her hands behind the bush. I guess there was something in the wind and I followed you all the way. When you stopped, I tethered little Ginger in a grove and I crept after you through the wood. It's as well I did for the whole parish was up. But Tom Spring was sitting gazing at him in blank amazement. His lordship, he gasped. No less, my boy. Lord Falconbridge, chairman of the bench, deputy lieutenant of the county, peer of the realm. That's your man. Good lord. And you didn't know? It's as well, for maybe you wouldn't have whacked it in as hard as you had. And mind you, if you hadn't, he'd have beat you. There's not a man in this county could stand up to him. He takes the poachers and the gypsies two and three at a time. He's the terror of the place. But you did him. Did him fair. Oh, man, it was fine. Tom Spring was too much dazed by what he heard to do more than sit and wonder. It was not until he had got back to the comforts of the inn, and after a bath had partaken of a solid meal, that he sent for Mr. Cordery, the landlord. To him he confided the whole train of events which had led up to his remarkable experience, and he begged him to throw such light as he could upon it. Cordery listened with keen interest and many chuckles to the story. Finally, he left the room and returned with a frayed newspaper in his hand, which he smoothed out upon his knee. It's the Pantiles Gazette, Mr. Spring, as gossiping a rag as ever was printed. I expect there will be a fine column in it, if ever it gets into prying nose into this day's doings. However, we are mum, and her ladyship is mum, and my word, his lordship is mum, though he did in his passion raise the hue and cry on you. Here it is, Mr. Spring, and I'll read it to you while you smoke your pipe. It's dated July of last year, and it goes like this. Fracas and highlight. It is an open secret that the differences which have for some years been known to exist between Lord Falconbridge and his beautiful wife have come to a head during the last few days. His lordship's devotion to sport, and also, as it is whispered, some attentions which he has shown to a humbler member of his household have, it is said, long alienated Lady Falconbridge's affection. Of late, she has sought consolation and friendship with a gentleman whom we will designate as Sir George. Sir George, who was a famous lady killer, and as well proportioned a man as any in England, took kindly to the task of consoling the disconsolate fair. The upshot, however, was vastly unfortunate, both for the lady's feelings and for the gentleman's beauty. The two friends were surprised in a rendezvous near the house by Lord Falconbridge himself, at the head of a party of his servants. Lord Falconbridge then and there, in spite of the shrieks of the lady, availed himself of his strength and skill to administer such punishment to the unfortunate Lothario as would, in his own parting words, prevent any woman from loving him again for the sake of his appearance. Lady Falconbridge has left his lordship and betaken herself to London, where, no doubt, she is now engaged in nursing the damaged Apollo. It is confidently expected that a duel will result from the affair, but no particulars have reached us up to the hour of going to press. The landlord laid down the paper. You've been moving in high life, Mr. Thomas Spring, said he. The pugilist passed his hand over his battered face. Well, Mr. Cordery, said he, low life is good enough for me. End of chapter 17 Read by Aaron James Walker Columbus, Ohio, May 16th, 2022